This is the final video for the 3.11 update and it is all about scripting. I will start to talk about the scripted button functions where I also will discuss the new timer feature. I continue with scripted faders including a new init plus event then scripted vpots and I finish off with new math functions. I will use some example scripts in this video and you can download those scripts from the description below. So let's take a look at the generic MIDI scripted button and you will notice that it looks very much like the old script button and that's because it is like the old script button. It doesn't have the predefined scripts drop down, but apart from that, it is identical. So if you are scripting for button functions, you can use either button. It doesn't matter which one. The new timer feature is very useful when you are scripting for buttons, since it can be used to have different actions performed if you press or double press a button, or if you long press it. And I will show example scripts for how to do that. A timer is a simple stopwatch that you can start and stop, and you can trigger on elapsed time. Timers have the same naming convention as variables, but are prefixed with T underscore or timer underscore. As I mentioned in the first video, if you have variables prefixed with t underscore or timer underscore, you must rename those, otherwise they will be treated as timers and not variables. A timer will count milliseconds while it is running, and you can control a timer with four distinct actions. You can run, pause, reset and restart a timer. Any one of these commands can be the first command for a timer, and if it is the first command, it will create the timer. The run command will ensure that the timer is running. If it was running, it will simply continue to run, and if it was not running, it will be started from the current value. The pause command will stop a timer at its current value, so if you pause and then run a timer, it will continue to run from its current value. The reset command will stop a timer if it is running and reset the value to zero. And the restart command is a combination of all the above. If the timer is running, it will be stopped. The value will be reset to zero and the timer will be started again. A timer occupies virtually no system resources, so you don't need to worry about having timers running or stopped. You can have timer events that trigger on an exact elapsed time in milliseconds. You cannot have transitions or intervals or anything else, so you must have a distinct value in milliseconds for the timer event. In the example scripts that I am about to show, I will not explain all the details. So if you want to take a closer look at how they work, you can either pause the video or download the scripts from the description below. The first script shows how you can have different actions performed depending on the number of times you press the button within a two second period. So if I press the button, it says single press, and if I double press it, it will say double press and triple press. The second example script shows how you can have different actions performed if you press the button shorter than one second or longer than one second. So if I press it briefly, it said short press, and if I have it hold longer than one second, it says long press. That's all for the scripted button and the timer feature. So let's move on to scripted faders. 
So if I change this button to a scripted fader, you will see that the scripted fader have many of the same editor properties as the non-scripted fader. There is one important difference that you should be aware of. If I make a copy of this button and paste it, the button cannot detect that these two buttons should control the same thing. So when using scripted faders, you must explicitly define the lower and upper roles for the faders. So this is the upper button and this is the lower button. Once you have defined the roles, the buttons are linked just as for non-scripted faders. When using two buttons like this, you have a single script that controls both buttons and that script must be defined for the lower button. You cannot define a script for the upper button. So you have a single script that controls both buttons. There are a number of new actions you can use to control the fader buttons. You have a fader action where you can set the fader position. You have a view action for the view level. You have a design action with which you can change the fader design. You can either use a path to a custom design or use the name of a built-in design as displayed in the design dropdown. You can reference a custom design by name if it has been referenced with path before so the plugin know where the files are. The speed action sets the speed for the fader. And these four actions span both buttons. So if you change fader, view, design or speed, it will affect both buttons. You can set the state icon with a path, a size and a position and a text to display on the button. And these four actions control the lower button or a single button. In a two-button configuration, you have four other actions for the icon and the text for the upper button. Fader events can be of two kinds depending on the fader speed. When the fader speed is in the range 1 to 100, I call this fader mode. And I think this is the normal operation for the button. In this mode, the plugin will move the fader just as for non-scripted faders. And for each step, it will trigger a fader event with the current position of the fader. And as long as the button is held, the fader will move and you will get fader events with the current position. When the fader speed is zero, I call this button mode. In this mode, the plugin will not move the fader. And from an event point of view, the button works as a scripted button. So when the button is pressed, you will get a press event. And when it is released, you will get a release event. You can use this if you, for instance, want to see the fader position and possibly the view level and state icons and whatever on the button, but you want the button to control something else, for instance, the mute state for the channel. So let's load the example script for the fader, which is doing a lot of things just for the fun of it. So let me explain things. The fader is connected to the fader of track one in Cubase. So when I move the fader in Cubase, it moves on Stream Deck. And of course I can control the fader from Stream Deck. The VU level is not connected to a VU. It is connected to the fader level of track two. So I can control the VU level with track 2. Just to show that you don't have to connect the VU level to a VU source, you can connect it to whatever you like. If you want to see the fader level for a group track or a master track or something like that, you can do that. On the lower button, I have a state icon connected to the solo state. So if I solo the track, 
it will show that the track is soloed. I also have a mute icon for the lower button, but that mute icon will fill the complete button. And when the track is muted, the button functions a bit differently. So if I now press the button, I will not control the fader, I will control the mute state. So when it is muted, I can unmute it with the button. And after that, I control the fader again. If I raise the volume fader, so it's above 100 in raw MIDI value, it will change the design to highlight that the fader level is getting quite high. If I continue to raise the fader level, I will show a state icon that will grow with higher fader levels. The script has actions for text display, but no text is displayed, and that is because you need to say in the editor if you want text to be displayed. So if you have value display controlled by script, you will have the text defined in the script displayed. Finally, there is a speed control on the buttons. If I turn the volume fader down and use the buttons to raise the level, you can see that initially there is quite a high speed and when I reach the upper levels it will lower the speed. In the example script you can see a number of init plus events, so let's talk about that. If you have a scripted button fader or vpot, and change to another page or profile and change back. It will not restore the state it had before the page change. The plugin does not know how to restore the state, so you must tell the plugin what to do. If we take the fader position in this example, you can have a command that reacts to real-time changes to the CC connected to the fader, but that command will only run when changes occur, so it will not run when the button is loaded, so not, nothing is restored. So you can add an init command for the same CC that will restore the fader position to the last known state for that CC, or whatever you have connected to the fader. The new feature in this release is that you can combine these two usages with an init plus command. So init plus commands will be run when the button is loaded and they will also run for runtime changes of that CC. You can of course still use the init command if there are things that only should be run when the button is loaded, but init plus is a very convenient way to ensure that everything that should be restored when you switch pages will be restored. So let's move to the final scripted vpots. So if I change these buttons to scripted vpots, it is very much like the faders. If you have two buttons that should control the same thing, you need to manually set the lower and upper roles and the script, the single script, is defined on the lower button and will control both buttons. The vpot actions and events are very much like the fader actions and events, except for the vu and state icons which are not available for vpots. But you can set the vpot position, you can change design and speed, and you can set the lower and upper button text. As for faders, if the speed is in range 1 to 100, the plugin will move the vpot and trigger vpot events for each step. If the speed is set to 0, you will get press and release events instead of the vpot events. So if I change to a vpot script, it's a very simple script. 
it is connected to the fader on channel 1 and it will change the design when the value is below or above 100. As with the fader buttons, if you have text actions in your scripts, you need to configure the value display to controlled by script. Otherwise, the text actions will not be displayed. Finally, I want to mention a couple of new math functions that could be interesting. And the best way to show this, I think, is with the web page. So on the math page, the new functions in 3.11 is marked with yellow text. And I think one important change is the range function that you can use to limit the result of a math expression to the MIDI value range. Some other interesting changes is for display where you have the L-pad and R-pad functions to add pad characters to the left or the right when you display text. And there are also three math functions to convert a value in milliseconds, for instance from a timer, to our minute and seconds display. That's all for this update. Thanks for watching. <laughs>